Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a model of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is Combating Anti-Semitism's Resurgence. Thank you to our very special guest, Professor Ira Foreman, adjunct professor on anti-Semitism at Georgetown University's Center for Jewish Civilization. Dr. Sharon Nazarian, Senior Vice President of International Affairs at the Anti-Defamation League. James Carroll, author of Constantine's Sword, The Church and the Jews. Kenneth Stern, Director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. Uh, our topic is combating anti-Semitism, and it is all too timely. In October, uh, the American Jewish Committee released a report on the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States. Uh, one American Jew in 10 said they had been targets of anti-Semitism in the previous year. Four in 10 said they had changed their behavior uh, out of fear. In May, uh, during the flare-up of violence between Israel and the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, anti-Israel protests around the world seemed to jump the line uh, between protest against Israel and protest against Jews in general. Some protests went violent. Uh, what can and should be done in response, uh, and why is it happening? Uh, we have a panel of four guests who bring expertise and experience to those very questions. Can we start with Ira Foreman, uh, now of Georgetown University, who joins us from Washington, D.C. Uh, combating anti-Semitism used to be part of Ira Foreman's job description. Uh, from 2013 to 2017, he was the U.S. Special Envoy for monitoring and combating anti-Semitism. That's a post at the State Department that is currently vacant. Uh, before that post, Mr. Foreman was Executive Director of the National Jewish Democratic Council. Uh, Ira Foreman, thank you very much for, for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Uh, before hearing about what the State Department and the Special Envoy can do about anti-Semitism, I'd like you to, just for a moment, thinking about anti-Semitism uh, anti everywhere, here and abroad, uh, to combat it, we should understand it. Do you understand why there is a resurgence of anti-Semitism right now? I wish I could say I do. Um, you know, I think there are certain factors like uh, worldwide economic problems, the pandemic, uh, but I don't think it, I, I, maybe people smarter than I, uh, have a kind of a global view of why. Um, I can tell you that in the United States that we've had a, a, what I would say a loss of taboos, you know, used to be kind of in polite society, you wouldn't say things about Jews. That's beginning to break down. And of course, with other ethnic and religious minorities as well. Uh, and you can describe it. I don't think I know exactly why. I think the best description I've ever read is uh, Robert Nuremberg's book, Anti-Judaism, in which he, he posits that uh, anti-Semitism or Jewish hatred is central to the development of Western civilization. It's often how Western civilization is thought about issues is in terms of Jews. And um, hmm. I think that's as good an explanation as any. Uh, 
well, uh, you were at the State Department, and tell us what what can a special envoy whose job is to monitor and combat anti-Semitism actually do? And when you say when you were in office, if you were seeing uh, physical attacks on uh, some Jews in France uh, and um, a British Labour Party with a leader who seemed to tolerate uh, uh, pretty uh, harsh anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, a Hungarian leader whose nationalism is uh, laced with the uh, tropes of, of anti, and who certainly demonized at least one, anti one, one Jew, George Soros. How, how do you choose your targets and how can you be effective in that role? Well, I think every anti-Semitism uh, 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 envoy has to really decide at the beginning what's their kind of priorities. I mean, the, the legislation that created this office merely says combating and monitoring. And, uh, and the monitoring is done these days uh, partly by the envoy, but mainly by our incredible uh, teams in our embassies and consulates who do this amazing job throughout the year of sending back reports about incidents of anti-Semitism, which are later published in the Human Rights Report and the International Religious Freedom Report. But combating uh, is, again, to a large degree, each envoy has to decide. For us, in our office, we came together and thought, how do we reduce pressure on Jewish communities around the world? And how would, you can define pressure as violence. You can define it as, say, rhetoric from the government. You can define it as things like uh, attempts to uh, ban circumcision or ban uh, kosher slaughter. You can define it in numerous ways. Uh, and we tried to make a, a list of our top 10 because you're constantly top 10 countries because you're constantly triaging. You never have enough resources and there's mm -hmm. more resources now than there's ever been, but you still never have enough. So you have to triage and decide what's the most important thing. When people are killed, obviously that raises to the top, but we had a, a series of kind of uh, objective kind of facts that we looked at and the other point that you have to, uh, I think, understand, I think makes it difficult, is anti-Semitism morphs, it shape shifts. And we've seen, if anything, it accelerating during the pandemic with uh, the types of anti-Semitism. You mentioned the UK. Uh, prior to Corbyn coming, becoming the head of labor, uh, left-wing um, anti-Semitism was not cons considered generally the major problem in the UK. Uh, that changed dramatically when Corbyn came to uh, came to power in the Labour Party. Uh, and I can give you a uh, chapter and verse on other countries as well. We did see violence against Jews. Uh, in my time, it's gotten worse, but in 2014 with the past Gaza war, there were demonstrations in Europe. And just to, just to end, Robert, by yeah. talking about, I got a call, I was calling and monitoring communities in France and Germany and Belgium and Netherlands, uh, throughout that period in August, July and August of 2014. And when the big demonstration started in the first week, there were, uh, as you mentioned, numerous incidents of violence against Jews in places like France and Belgium and Germany. And I got a call from a rabbi who I had just met with a few months before in my trip to Europe. And he said to me, Ira, I don't know what you can do, but uh, last weekend we had violence in the streets. And this weekend, the demonstrations are going to get bigger. We expect more problems and we can't get security forces to really answer us and say what they can help us uh, defend against this. And I said, I don't know what I can do, but let me make a call or two. Mm -hmm. so I called the uh, our embassy uh, and talked to the DCM, the deputy chief of mission or second ranking person diplomat and explained the situation. He said, Ira, I don't know what I can do, but let me see. I'll call you back and tell you what happens. Well, he never called me back. But the next day, the rabbi called me and said, I don't know what you did, Ira, but mm -hmm. the security forces are all over us, uh, trying to see what they can do to protect our institutions and our people in the coming days. That's just one little example. There's yeah. lots of others. Just just, just very quickly, is, is it, uh, at least in that role, we're talking government to government or, or government to influential people in other countries. Uh, is, is there any utility to reaching the people who might be swayed by anti-Semitic arguments rather than those who are doing the the swaying or, or uh, uh, being uh, le less than robust in combating what's happening? No, well, that's a great question. And, and sometimes you, f you decide that the anti-Semite can't be reached, but other times you decide that you can. But frankly, it's not just a role for government. And the, the job of the envoy is in some ways not as a, a leader that does things left and right, 
but often coordinates because you need all kinds of assets uh, to combat anti-Semitism. This can't be uh, combated just by the Jewish community. It can't be combated just by the United States government and the Jewish community alone. Uh, we need other kinds of allies. So in almost everything we did, we worked with the, our government officers and consulates and embassies and, and in Washington, but we also worked with NGOs, often Jewish NGOs like ADL, AJC, et cetera, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center, and uh, go on and on. Uh, they would help us and they had resources and things we didn't have, often have, and they had different ways to approach problems. And you had to use your our allies in democratic Europe, primarily in Israel, to help us as well. So it, it's, um, it's a bit of a coordination job. And I think in some ways, more, the most successful part is when it's not just the United States leading, but you're right. In terms of the United States power directly, it's the bilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes, uh, you know, we, I know we talk a lot about Iran. It's important. The Jewish community there is in, really has, in, has declined dramatically and uh, lives under real restrictions. Um, but we have limited bilateral tools right. because of our, we have no real relationship with Iran. And the issues we're dealing with are otherwise are also huge. So that makes it more difficult. Ira, thank you, and yeah. uh, and hang around because uh, we'll do. have the Q and A session uh, in a little while. Our next panelist, uh, speaking of of Iran, is Sharon Nazarian, who joins us from Los Angeles, uh, where she's lived most of her life. But uh, Dr. Nazarian, who has a PhD from the University of Southern California, uh, was born in Tehran, and like many families of Iran's Jewish community, uh, hers left after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. She is now a senior vice president for international affairs at the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, Sharon Nazarian, thanks for, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, you, you've described this past May and the anti-Israeli or, or pro-Hamas protest that took place as, as a watershed moment. Uh, how so? Robert, first of all, thank you for having me on this wonderful program and uh, really the opportunity to educate um, audiences um, everywhere on these very critical issues. Um, last May, and I think Ara referred to it um, uh, in terms of the cycle of violence that happens in the Middle East, and we know what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And from my perspective, especially as head of international for ADL, where I'm primarily responsible for everything that happens outside the US, but also in the US. We saw narratives, rhetoric that had always been there, but had been in the fringes, um, essentially get mainstreamed. So anti-Israel uh, criticism has always been there. Settlement issues, issues about Israel's treatment of Palestinians, these are always been there. But this last conflict brought to the fore an acceptance, a mainstreaming of the hostility toward Israel, a real um, impetus to delegitimize the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, and really bring about voices who had never really opined on this issue. If you look at social media, for example, influencers who might have been, you know, actors or fashion uh, people speaking and opining on this, and essentially conflating what was happening in the U.S. around racial issues, especially in the BLM and post kind of George Floyd anti-racism movement, conflating a lot of those issues of racism onto the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So if you are anti-racism, you have to be anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. And see examples of that in other countries around the world, you know, in, in South Africa today, where the issue of apartheid is so personal to that country and to those citizens. If you're anti-apartheid, by definition today, you have to be anti-Israel because according to their definition, Israel is an apartheid state. If you're um, in Europe today and you're anti-colonial, which is a huge trend right now in Europe about, against colonialism, you have to be anti-Israel. So these trends that have always been there have now come into the fore, come into mainstream social media channels, um, something as simple as a parenting group. During the May conflict, there were instances in the U.S. where on, on mommy groups, um, members were asked to leave um, groups because on some Facebook posts, they had supported Israeli citizens um, who were being you know, attacked under these um, bombs coming down on them. So 
kind of the, the push towards really excluding Jews, pushing Jews out of progressive spaces. These were all really new um, trends that we saw that were hugely disturbing, Robert. Let's, let's, let's turn to where, where you were born in Iran. Uh, how, how would you describe the, uh, the level of anti-Semitism in Iran? So, Robert, when I look at the world, I really kind of look at the issue of anti-Semitism from two different lenses. One lens is the level of threat facing Jewish communities around the world. So if there is a Jewish community in the country, in that country, I look at what are the th threats facing them and what can ADL do about it. On the other hand, I look at which are the worst actors in the world today mm -hmm. propagating anti-Semitism. And I would say for that answer, Iran tops my list. Iran, according to ADL, is the number one state sponsor of anti-Semitic and Holocaust denial rhetoric and activity not just words, but actual actions um, when it comes to governments. And so my country of birth is one that, yes, there is still a small community there, and Ira referred to that community. We call them the like, captured community. It's the kind of Jewish community that can in no way be openly public in yeah. terms of its sentiment, in terms of its feelings about Israel or anything, and any moment can face charges of espionage, charge of spying for the Israeli government. So they're really between a rock and a hard place. That's a very difficult. Country. You refer to them as, as, a, as a, a hostage population or captive population. I mean, there is a point when uh, the only way to combat anti-Semitism in a country that is deeply anti-Semitic and actively so is to do what your family did, which is to leave, uh, or what my grandparents did in uh, Tsarist Poland uh, to get out and, and uh, come here. Um, is, is the situation in Iran remediable uh, or, uh, frankly, would it be best for any Jew who's there to leave if they could? Well, you know, I'm very torn about this question, Robert. Um, Iranian Jews, our history goes back 2,700 years. So the prospect of ending this really illustrious uh, community and no more Jews being left like it's happened in so many Middle Eastern countries today is really, truly sad for me. And would I want to push for the end of Jewish communal life in Iran? I would say I would not want to. What I would like to do is shame and name the regime of Iran, the government of Iran, the way it treats its own citizens and pays lip service to the protection of religious minorities on one hand, and yet they feel daily threats um, as citizens of Iran. So my job at EDL today is mostly about documenting what the regime says publicly, what it does when it holds Holocaust denying contests, literal contests, where Holocaust deniers from around the world send in their cartoons or send in their research and reports where they are providing quote unquote evidence that the Holocaust didn't happen or it's a myth. So my job every day becomes about advocating with other governments and mm -hmm. with the Biden administration for that matter, when it's dealing with the, with the regime in nuclear negotiations or other parts of kind of world diplomacy to make sure that this issue about the way the regime treats its own citizens, its own religious minorities is not forgotten. So that- is there, yeah. Sharon is there and uh, thank you very much and, uh, and stick with us. We'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, it's time for our next panelist. Uh, who is Kenneth Stern. Uh, Ken directs uh, Bard College's Center for the Study of Hate. Uh, he's a lawyer by training and from 1989 until 2014, uh, he worked for the American Jewish Committee directing the committee's work on anti-Semitism and extremism. Uh, 20 years ago, he was uh, one of those uh, who drafted the working definition of anti-Semitism, which has been adopted by many uh, international groups that monitor anti-Semitism. Ken Stern, welcome. Thank you uh, so much for having me. Anil, and uh, you've spoken of viewing anti-Semitism through a larger lens uh, than we might be inclined to do. What do you mean by that? Well, thank you, Robert. A, a number of things. One is we tend logically to think about anti-Semitism as just a matter of Jews. But I worry that we're missing some of the larger dynamics that drive anti-Semitism when we talk about why it's increasing and what we ought to do about it. To give you one quick example, we all would recognize the attack on the Pittsburgh synagogue as an anti-Semitic incident. Of course it was. You had Bowers, who was upset about uh, brown-skinned people coming in over the uh, southern border 
and seeing Jews as somehow responsible because it was a, a highest group, a pro-immigration group that had been meeting in the synagogue. Nobody would think of the shooting of the Walmart uh, in El Paso a few months later, which was directly against Mexicans and Mexican-Americans as an incident of anti-Semitism. But if you look at the ideology and the motives that drove both shooters, they were nearly identical. So what I believe is that we need to think about a little bit more largely about the movements. Secondly, to, to pick up on your question to Ira, I mean, I don't have a, a great answer for what propels all sorts of things about anti-Semitism, but I do believe there are some things that we need to consider that aren't just about Jews. We know that anti-Semitism you know, at core is conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy theory about Jews trying to harm non-Jews and giving an explanation for what goes wrong in the world. And when conspiracy theories are more normalized in societies, we're more likely to see anti-Semitism. When I was writing about the militia movement in the 90s, I had a friend who um, was working on these issues in Montana, and he described the militias as a funnel moving through space. And what he meant by that was that people were coming into the militia movement through issues such as gun control and land use planning. Once they got sucked into the system of thinking, they got exposed to conspiracy theories. And when they got sucked further down, it was the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And the more pressure at the front of the funnel, the more people that came out like Timothy McVeigh. Um, one of the things that we know from the growing field of hate studies, too, is relevant to this, in that we're primed as human beings to see an us and a them, um, and to divide the world that way. And sometimes we know that leads to disastrous things, including hatred and anti-Semitism. Part of what happens when we see the world that way, uh, and we're supercharged to see the world that way, when our identity is tethered to an issue of perceived social justice or injustice, yes. um, we tend to reduce things to black and white, good and bad, and make them simple. When leaders push that type of thinking too, um, it makes it more acceptable for people to run into it. So in the last few years, as much as I was concerned about issues of anti-Semitism, when you had leaders talking about anti-immigrant, particularly by uh, former President Trump, talking about Muslims having to register and uh, anti-immigrant language, that primes the pump yes. for a system in which anti-Semitism is likely to grow. But isn't isn't uh, uh, the, the risk of uh, of using the larger lens that uh, we the, that anti-Semitism loses its specificity? Uh, that it it, it we we uh, it would be better for us to live in a society that's universally tolerant and that uh, uh, isn't racist and isn't anti-immigrant or xenophobic. Uh, but um, even in some countries that aren't those things, there can still be anti-Semitism, which is uh, an extremely uh, long form, a, a, oh. a, a very old form of hatred. And there are unique events like the Holocaust and to Jews like the creation of the state of Israel. That are, oh, uh, I, I, absolutely, absolutely, Robert. And, and you know, Ira will well remember things like I'm going to describe. I remember meeting with a, a French minister who was talking about attacks on Jews in the early 2000s. Um, and he was trying to make it disappear by talking about hooligans and a generalized racism. And there's lots of times where people try to make anti-Semitism disappear into a larger frame that way. And that's a problem. And I, I fully yeah. think that it's right to point it out. But the flip side to me is the more important. It's not like anti-Semitism is the only hatred that exists in the world. And if we don't think about what we learn from all the different academic fields and other studies into racism and hatred, to shine a better light on how anti-Semitism works and what to do about it, we're missing most of the picture, in my view. Um, what, what should we make of the fact that the, the American university or college campus, which uh, at least on the coast uh, is, is presumed to be a liberal place uh, most often, a generally liberal place, uh, is a place where, where there are students and faculty who are deeply concerned about many of the hates that you've, that you've mentioned, uh, and and yet, uh, Jewish students uh, might see themselves and their own people's history as part of that uh, are not welcome, in, as as Sharon has said, in in progressive circles. Uh, is is the American campus hostile territory to a young person who identifies as a Jew? 
Well, to put it into perspective, let me give you some data. Uh, there are 4,000 American campuses, and very few of them are, is Israel an issue at all. Um, and those where it is, if you look at the, the, the programs that happen year to year, usually two times pro-Israel programs to anti-Israel ones. That's not to say there aren't things that happen that are ugly, uh, that there are problems, um, but you know, it, it's not like the campuses are burning. Secondly, this is not new in a way. I remember dealing with these issues around 1982, working in, as a progressive lawyer in circles and being told because I was a Zionist there were issues. But the, the, the irony of all this is that on both sides, people are getting so ginned up and trying to shut the other down. So there is exactly you know, what you're describing, some trying to push out people and presuming um, because of who they are, what they believe. Um, but it's happening you know, in the other direction too. It's not only the pro-Palestinian uh, folks trying to shut down uh, pro-Israel speakers, it's also people trying to use law and other uh, things to try to stop pro-Palestinian speech. And the ultimate irony of this, and I have this in the last chapter of my book about the conflict over the conflict, the campus is the ideal place for mining these difficult issues and how people should think about things when they're you know, disturbed to their core. Um, and there are things to do about it, but I agree that there are problems in place to place. When you worked on the definition of anti-Semitism, uh, there was some controversy over what degree of criticism of Israel should be included as being anti-Semitic and what should not be included as anti-Semitic. Where does that stand? Where, where do people who sign on to that global definition say the criticism of Israel ceases to be merely uh, regarding the uh, tactics in Gaza as being uh, disproportionate or, 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 uh, or building more settlements and moves into something that is, that is anti-Semitic? Well, the, the, the problem to me is not the definition, but how it, it's being used. It was never meant as sort of a Hogwarts-like sorting hat to say who's anti-Semitic and who's not, right. you know, it, to look at, at uh, the tea leaves and certain expressions. It was more of looking at three things. Uh, one was to try to create uh, a, a tool to take a temperature of uh, anti-Semitism over time and across borders, particularly in Europe, and as we've you know we've seen, there are times when there's anti-Israel rhetoric that that correlates. I'm not saying it causes, but it correlates with attacks on Jews. So it was important to see some of that for data collection and and taking temperature. It's important for hate crimes for saying you don't want to look at um, what uh, motivated people. You want to look at their intent to target Jews. It was used also for. Uh, diplomatic purposes um, as well. But the problem with the definition and the questions about it to me are, are not you know, what it contains, but it's being used for a purpose that was never intended to be applied to. Yeah. Ken, thank you. We'll be back in a moment with questions, but uh, we're now going to hear from our fourth panelist, who's here to provide some historical background and some uh, thoughts on contemporary anti-Semitism as well. James Carroll is an op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe. Uh, he's the author of many books, works of fiction and nonfiction, prose and poetry. Uh, one of his books, Constantine's Sword, The Church and the Jews, uh, places the origin of anti-Semitism in the anti-Judaism of the early Catholic Church. And the, the book has its critics, Personally, I think that, uh, of it as the book that every Jew uh, wishes every Catholic would read, if not write. Uh, Jim Carroll, welcome uh, to, our, to our panel. It's good to see you. Uh, you, you wrote about the, the anti-Jewish turn that the church took uh, in its early days, a kind of theological anti-Semitism. People very often say nowadays, we're dealing with different kinds of anti-Semitism. We're dealing with the anti-Semitism that began with the Jew who couldn't fit into Enlightenment philosophy's view of, uh, of what Europe should be like, or the Jew who couldn't fit into uh, the age of the nation state when ethnicity and uh, nationality merged into one and the Jew was outside. Uh, are we still dealing, do we still have a problem with the old fashioned, religious rooted anti Semitism? Well, first, thanks, Robert, for having me. And I'm really honored to be part of saluting and supporting the Rabin Medical, Medical Center. Thank you. Uh, I come at this as a Christian, and so I'm, my point of view has to be somewhat skewed, but it's a, a quite relevant point of view since the whole problem we're discussing begins with Christian and church attitudes toward the Jewish people. And you're right to point out that that's 
a kind of historic uh, phenomenon dating back 2,000 years in its origins, but it hasn't gone away. And my argument, uh, and actually I, I, I find myself thinking this as I hear the discussion today, mm -hmm. my argument is that there's a kind of default flawed response in Western culture, in the Western imagination, that is ready in surprising instances when there are stresses of various kinds to fault, to denigrate, or even to scapegoat Jews. And it begins with a simple mistake of Christian memory. Christians forgot that Jesus was a Jew. And they told the story of Jesus as if it were a story of Jesus against his own people. And that mistake in the Christian memory, uh, you might say, is the bug in the software of the West. Mm -hmm. You, you, uh, there's something you mentioned which, which sticks in my, in my memory at least or almost 20 years since I read Constantine's Sword, and that was uh, you quoted the great Jewish Enlightenment uh, philosopher Moses Mendelssohn as uh, saying that but for uh, St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, but for his uh, lovely brainwave, we would have been exterminated long ago. What was it that occurred to uh, uh, Augustine? That, that was this brainwave that, that uh, permitted Jewish survival and also centuries of discrimination against Jews. Well, it's a good example of how that deep history is still relevant today. In the fourth and fifth century, as the Catholic Church became the Roman Empire and began to enforce its orthodoxy with violence, uh, defenders of orthodoxy attacked and killed many, many so-called heretics which quickly raised a, a kind of blatantly obvious question, which was, if you can be put to death for dissenting on a question about the Holy Trinity, a detail, why are these Jews who reject the entire uh, schema of Christian belief, why are they allowed to survive? And uh, Jews were quite at risk, along with Christian heretics, uh, in this crucial period for simply being put to death. The final solution could have happened in the fourth and early fifth century. It didn't. Why? Augustine, the most important Catholic theologian of the moment, issued a kind of declaration that Jews must be allowed to survive as Jews within the Christian world. Unlike Arians or Docetists or other heretics, Jews survive as Jews unmolested, essentially. And why? Because by their very misery, they're not at home, they're forbidden to return to their homeland, they're the wandering people, they have no power, no rights. By their very misery, they prove the truth of Christian claims. How do we know what we believe is true? Look at those Jews who don't believe it, and look how they live. So Jews must survive. But the catch here, of course, was that they must never thrive. And down through the centuries, whenever Jews presumed to thrive, they were inviting trouble. And sure enough, it came. Yeah. So uh, Augustine, both a lovely brainwave that enabled the Jews to survive, but he put in place the structure of denigration that accounted for this deeply, deeply sinful history of contempt for the Jewish people. Just, just one other point. You were a, a you were a Roman Catholic priest for five years. I was uh, in your adult life and mine, uh, the Catholic Church has made great changes about uh, its, its dealings with the Jews. Uh, it's made some liturgical changes. Pope John Paul II acknowledge the significance of the Holocaust, uh, visited a synagogue. It, is, is the story of what's happened with the Catholic Church uh, at some level a hopeful one that uh, after enough discussion and thought and complaint, uh, a, an institute, the, the, one of the original institutions in the world it's, can it's actually really, adjust, can change. Robert, is the most hopeful story yes. on this subject. Because the church for centuries was the custodian of anti-Judaism. Mm -hmm. 
which was the generator of anti-Semitism. And in the Second Vatican Council, led by Pope John XXIII, who was the, one of the few prelates to actively participate in resistance to the Holocaust, Pope John called the council, and one of his main motives in doing so was to address the Christian failure in relation to the Jewish people that had been laid bare so powerfully. And the result of that was Nostra Tate, the Vatican Council's declaration on the Jewish people, which did two things. It renounced the Christ killer slander, which has been the engine of Christian contempt for Jews, that lie that the Jews murdered Jesus, not the Romans murdered Jesus, the Jew. And the other thing that Nostra Aetate did was it affir affirmed the ongoing permanence of God's covenant with Israel. In other words, you don't, the Jews go to God through the covenant God has made with Israel. They don't go to God through Jesus, which is the ground of a revolution in Christian theology, the most important change in the history of the church. And if this can change, Robert, the constellation of other sources of the bigotry we're discussing can also change. Jim Carroll, thank you very much. And we're going to call back now Ira Foreman, Ken Stern, Sharon Nazarian, uh, and uh, Jim, please stay with us. And we'll address some questions that uh, people have, have posed to us. Uh, one of them, uh, which is, uh, I, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll ask this of, of Ira and Sharon. Uh, someone asks anonymously, why has Congress still not confirmed Deborah Lipstadt as anti-Semitism envoy? What's the holdup? Why won't they deal with it? Uh, Ira Foreman, do you have an answer? Uh, well, like almost every other issue uh, and the constellation facing U.S. government, this has become politicized. Uh, you would think that this is the last issue, and in some ways it has been, but it's, um, it is totally politicized, and Republicans are putting holds. Now, they, the, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at some point can decide, uh, breaking some precedent, to bring up uh, without, any, without Republican support the nomination. Uh, but it's hard for me with many of the, our, our, the friends um, that the Jewish people have in the Republican Party to see how that this can be justified. Uh, um, and I, you know, I'm a partisan Democrat from my background, but there is no way that we effectively deal with anti-Semitism uh, in, a, in a partisan way. And when I hear people say, well, the, really the problem is on the right. It's not, it's all about, you know, xenophobic, uh, violent anti-Semitism. Or, uh, or I hear people on the left saying it's, uh, it, uh, on the right saying it's all about leftists or all about Muslims. Yeah. That's anti-Semitism. And if they refuse to call out their own allies, these are people that are not fighting anti-Semitism. They're fighting their own partisan or ideological fights. There is no room for partisanship on this issue. It's deadly. And uh, it's, a, it's a real, real problem. Now, I think Deborah's going to get through at some point because yeah. they're just going to, uh, there'll be pressure from not to just the Jewish community, but other segments that this post needs to be filled. Um, but it's very disturbing yeah. that this has happened. And, well, you know, the, ostensibly it's because Deborah uh, in some Twitter feeds has criticized Republicans. It, it's hardly um, uh, language that goes beyond the normal political dialogue. And uh, it's really disheartening. So, uh, as I said, I think it'll happen, if not this year, early next. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real shame because Deborah needs to be there to really guide this program. And the, government, and the U.S. role is, though the U.S. doesn't have any silver bullets for this, the U.S. role is really critical. Uh, Sharon Nazarian, uh, you, you uh, from from your perspective at ADL, how how important is the the uh, filling up this position or not filling this? Which is, as I admit, it's not that there are no silver bullets for dealing with anti-Semitism, but um, uh, you, you've you've told me it's actually quite important that the, the job be filled. Absolutely, Robert. It is critical and so important that actually last week we um, at ADL, along with twenty other major Jewish organizations, came together held a program, which Ira was a, a panelist on, of all four past onboards, 
This was a bipartisan event. This was both past Democratic and Republican envoys were uh, represented speaking about the importance of this post. And I can tell you, Robert, when I go around the world and I sit in conferences, I meet with heads of state, foreign ministers, the fact that the Biden administration right now does not have a special envoy on combating anti-Semitism speaks volumes. And it's detrimental to the fight against anti-Semitism. When you're not speaking with one voice as the most important force in the world right now, um, in so many arenas, and you don't have someone representing you in the fight against anti-Semitism, that speaks volumes. So we have been pushing very hard for the post to be filled, just like we did under the Trump administration, by the way. It took a long time under President Trump as well, mm -hmm. or Elon Carr to be appointed and confirmed. So this, unfortunately, is a bad track record that's now ongoing. And I think to Iris' point, the politicization of this office is a huge, huge detriment to the fight against anti-Semitism. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that the position is, it was, you know, it was just elevated to an ambassadorship. And I think that also further politicizes it. But we have to do everything possible to make sure the position is filled and that representatives out there in the world. I, I should just add here, as somebody who worked in Washington for many years and still lives nearby, that uh, nowadays uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, special envoy for anti-Semitism is by no means the only uh, position that's that's late in this incredibly slow process of confirmation that we now have in Washington, where uh, dozens of uh, of positions requiring confirmation are are being filled on an acting basis or not being filled at all right now. Uh, this is a quite this is an interesting question from Debbie Organ, uh, who writes: Is there not a need for quote Jewish unity? This begs a question, but for Jewish unity to be a response to anti-Semitism in order to outsmart anti-Semitism. Um, Ken Stern, uh, I, you, you want know, to, you can tell the joke about the Jewish man who's found on the desert island and right. where there are three synagogues, right, uh, although exactly. he's alone. Right. Jewish unity? It, it's never going to happen. You know, any, no community has total unity. And part of what, what the debate is about, about anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism in Israel is this an internal debate inside the Jewish community about whether a particular attitude towards Israel is required to be inside the tent. Mm -hmm. And so that's the subtext in which this is going to play out. But one thing that I would say is that, you know, to, and to amplify Ira's point, and Deborah Lipstadt, who I, who I love, who I've worked with on her trial with the Holocaust denier 20 years ago, has been consistently saying, is that anti-Semitism is something that you need to condemn uh, even among your allies and particularly in some ways among your allies. And what I see too much of is people say, well, you know, they have a particular view on Israel. It's my view on Israel. Therefore, if they do something I'm going to, um, that's anti-Semitic, I'm going to give them a pass. And I, I even, you know, I have a problem with Netanyahu. You were talking before, Robert, about uh, Orban. Uh, yeah. And his, you know, the posters of George Soros. Well, Netanyahu was cozying up to Orban because he's a friend of Israel. Excuse me, he's promoting anti-Semitism. And you say the same, you know, challenges on the left too. So I don't think there's ever going to be Jewish unanimity. I think what we should strive to is to be consistent when we call out anti-Semitism on people that are opponents to us and our views of Israel. We should do the same with people that agree with us. This is a question from Shira Goldman, who asks, uh, a lot of companies, including the large company I work for, have put DE and I, diversity, equity, and inclusion training programs in place over the past year. Is there any work going on to get anti-Semitism education added uh, to these programs? Uh, well, Ken, we'll start with you, is there? What? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there are some people that are pushing. Actually, I just did a, a program at Barnard on anti-Semitism. Um, but there are challenges, too. Um, again, it, it reflects some of, of what Sharon was saying about some of the politicization on the question of relations to Israel and who should be seen as progressive and who isn't. So, you know, it was ironic. I, I gave a talk about anti-Semitism at Barnard. Jewish Voice for Peace asked Barnard to disinvite me. Uh, even though it was under a DEI uh, thing, and obviously it didn't happen. But that was the flip side of the Zionist Organization of America not wanting me to do something very similar at Temple. Be 
because you um, weren't, they were saying you weren't pro-Israel enough. When, when I wasn't pro-Israel enough, when I was too pro-Israel. Yeah. So, Robert. Yes, yeah, sorry. Can I, can I add something since Ken brought this up? Um, you know, I, I think it's really important as we talk about this to recognize in any given time what forms of anti-Semitism are prevalent and most uh, damaging. And as I said before, they can change. In the United States, we have multiple forms. Uh, you can say things like, the violence against Jews, particularly killings, have all been in the last decade from the xenophobic right. But I'm uh, also very concerned on the left, and Ken brings up Barnard. You had Barnard's Jewish Voices for Peace, Jewish Voice for Peace, which is not, frankly, always all Jews. A lot of times it's not Jews there, too, saying, writing in response that not only does, is Israel committing genocide, which is fairly laughable, you can criticize Israel for many, many things. Genocide is not one of them. But Israel has killed millions of Palestinians. Now, these, this is an elite college with some of our most important young thinkers. And they're putting out lies that are comparable to Der Strummer stuff. And, you know, there's no excuse for those, these folks, even though they're college students, to be saying, well, I didn't know better. When you, that is literally blood libel. And uh, this is like intolerable. And I'm a person on the left, and I think it's really important to call that stuff out. And it was in the wake of, of Ken not just being trying to be disinvited, but being disrupted in his, but, his presentation. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, Ira, when you were uh, uh, this, this special envoy, for example, did you ever hear from European officials or from others, you know, uh, we'd have, we, we might have fewer intense anti-Israel uh, and anti-stepping across the line, anti-Jewish protests, mm -hmm if there were a peace process that uh, we're actually going somewhere in the Middle East and and if you could get, if you Americans could get your friends of the Israelis to uh, do something differently, perhaps it would be better in Europe for people. Did, did you ever hear something like that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. not, not just from Europeans. Uh, you know, there's this really uh, simple-minded view that the United States clicks its fingers and gets, and just everybody does its bidding, which is simply not true. Uh, that's the start, uh, but, I've heard stuff like that. I've heard stuff like that in places like uh, Northern Europe, fairly not infrequently. Um, I've also ha heard uh, a, a Hungarian uh, parliamentarian, when I started talking to him about anti Semitism, said, Well, you know, our anti Semitism was justified after World War II because the Jews were all Bolsheviks, uh, which is the, another great lie. Um, and uh, I just pointed out to him to his Holocaust Museum where there were two posters by the same artist. One, the Jew is a communist, is a, is a capitalist with a big fat uh, pinky ringed, uh, cigar smoking hook nosed Jew. And the next, it, the Jew is a Bolshevik yeah. with a skinny, crazy person hair, holding a bomb with a hook nose. And I said, you can't have both. In fact, you can't even have either, but you can't have both. And so, yeah, there are, there are always excuses for anti-Semitism. Uh, luckily, still in this country, you usually shoot them down pretty quickly. And even in Western Europe, it's getting a little harder to do that. One of the, I think it's one of the good, good trends, yeah. partly because of this. Um, I, I have a question for Jim Carroll, uh, which is you, you mentioned uh, what you describe as this, this amazing change that took place in, in the Catholic Church uh, over its, uh, its, its attitude toward, toward Jews and Judaism. Uh, and which which really begins with the Pope, the, the papacy of John the Twenty Third. If people are too young to recall, Vatican uh, the, the Second Vatican Council was an, an amazing time of of a church reform. Why did that happen then? Uh, you know, is it just is it just the, the force of personality of uh, of one man? Is it uh, uh, misgivings over the papacy of Pius the Twelfth during the the nineteen forties? What why at that moment? Uh, did the Catholic Church change, and did the influence of any particular individuals, other than, than Pope John the Twenty Third, have have a critical effect on that change? Well, Robert, it's a great question. I entered the seminary the year the Vatican Council convened, so my entire seven years of training for the Catholic priesthood was defined by reckoning with the Council and what it did and what it meant. And I've long since concluded that the Bishops, remember, this is the most conservative institution on the planet in some ways. Every Catholic bishop 
in the world was brought into St. Peter's Basilica, several, a couple of thousand of them sitting on bleachers, lining this largest church on the, in the world, uh, meeting in discrete sessions over three years, 1962 to 65. And they launched a radical uh, revolution in thought on any number of fronts, but most especially on this one. And why? And that's your question. They were in a state of shock, is all I can say. They were shocked out of the complacency and institutional defensiveness that should have marked that gathering. And the shock came mostly from their all having witnessed in their own time the failure of Christianity, especially including the Catholic Church, during the Holocaust. I mentioned John the Twenty-Third's own history. But all of the bishops lived through it. And even though they were still inclined to defend Pius XII, uh, deflect uh, essential criticisms, they all knew, they all knew that the church had failed in two ways. One, laying the groundwork for lethal Nazi anti-Semitism with religious anti-Judaism. They understood that that was a key problem. And the church, of course, had failed during the critical years of the war to, in any significant way, stand with the Jewish people, even as Catholics and Christians Mm -hmm. began to see what was happening. So that's what the other thing that happened, by the way, the week that the Vatican Council convened, it went quickly into adjournment because the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded. Yes, that's right. Was, we were aware first, of our mortality at that moment. The first, yeah, so. the first 10 days of the Council, they, like all of us alive then, stood on the precipice of world destruction. It yeah. concentrated their minds. Concentrates the mind, yes. Uh, a uh, question. May I? Yes, um, please. Can I Sharon, yes. The question that was asked about DEI, I think it's a very important question because yes. what is happening across America and maybe across the world is that so much of our parts of our society in the corporate sector and others are coming to terms with the need to educate our employees regarding um, um, inclusion uh, and diversity. But what is happening in those spaces is that anti-Semitism and the um, Jewish identity is completely being kept out. So I can tell you today and for your um, viewer who asked, ADL is definitely rolling out a specific corporate training on anti-Semitism that will be available to corporations in America. We've had a long list already sign on. And so we will be helping with DEI officers of large corporations to make sure they are including um, knowledge, content and um, education about anti-Semitism and Jewish identity into their DEI content. And we think it's a critical point that needs to be made and Jews should just not be kept out of those spaces. Uh, There's a question for you that's been uh, sent in, uh, Sharon, which is, uh, what can be done about anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist rhetoric in schools in Arab countries and in their media outlets? Uh, What will it take to make this problem go away? So that's a a real area of focus for us at ADL. And, you know, we at ADL are want to start with data. So we start looking at both opinion surveys and we look at actual textbooks. I have one member of my team specifically who every fall gets copies of high school textbooks from across the Arab world. And he does a very close assessment and analysis of language in that text. So everything from anti-Semitic, but also anti-Christian, anti-LGBT, we really cover the whole gamut of discriminatory language. And we do a report card on them. Yeah. So today, for example, we came out with one on, on uh, Kuwait. Um, we've done it on Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And we are very open about when we see improvements, we cite them and we commend them. And when we see backsliding and not change enough change happening, we, we call them out. So that's one a very important tool that they are sensitive to. I'm curious, in the uh, Emirates, in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, have you seen any uh, improvement uh, since the normalization of relations with Israel? Well, the improvement has actually started before the normalization. And we saw that um, the leadership of UAE understood that they had to prepare their society for this normalization, right? This normalization didn't happen with a light switch. It was a decade long of leaving kind of a path towards the actual signing and the normalization accord. So they already were in touch with us, with other organizations. 
looking at their own textbooks and how do they prepare their own population in coming to terms with kind of this reconciliation with Israel. And the textbooks were a very important part of it. So they have improved tremendously. They lead the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Even a country like Saudi Arabia that, you know, started out being in a very, very poor space when it comes to anti-Semitism and other issues has made some improvements. There's still more to go, but definitely head in the right direction. I'm going to give what may be our last question. Uh, first to Ken Stern. Uh, what can each of us do as individuals, writes an anonymous uh, questioner, uh, to combat anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Uh, as many of my friends and myself have experienced the scourge of anti-Semitism, what, what something ordinary people can do? Well, I think there's no one simple thing. There's no one magic bullet, but there are a number of things one can do to interrupt anti-Semitism when you see it. But there are, as I was arguing before, there are larger frames for things. I've, so one thing, for example, is support um, groups that are fighting back about other types of uh, intolerance fight things to try to normalize conspiracy theories. And ultimately, I think history shows that hatred flows best at times where democracy is most under stress. So, you know, and we're living in one of those times. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think if people do things to support democratic institutions, um, you know, the, the checks and balances of government, the free press, the independent judiciary, all those things, I think, matter when it comes to combating anti-Semitism as well. And they may be some of the more important things. Well, uh, Ken Stern, Sharon Nazari, and Jim Carroll, and I reform and thanks uh, to all of you for this discussion. Uh, many thanks also to Joshua Plout, uh, to uh, Nate Banzani, Roni Giuliano, and Sarah Lipoff of the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, uh, and our technical director, Sam Lanetta. Uh, our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization that represents, uh, in the United States, Israel's largest uh, hospital, Rabin Medical Center, in Petah Tikva, in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the website, by the way, for the Friends is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel. Uh, this has been Global Connections, the new normal we say these days. See you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.